Arnaldo here just bought this 1982 Turbo Mooney M20K in Dover, Delaware, and we are ferrying it home. On these long legs on autopilot, we have plenty of time to kill, so I decided to take the camera and do a very informal and unplanned in-flight tour of this Mooney's cockpit. I'm going to try and cover everything in the cockpit as best I can, and I will take a moment to describe the turbocharger system that is in this airplane as soon as I get to those instruments. I thought this would be an interesting video for a lot of my viewers, so on with the cockpit tour of this Mooney. Alright, while we're in the airplane, and we're at cruise, we're on autopilot, Arnaldo wants me, wants me, not him, to talk Flight about 90 contact, what's on the panel of this point. Yeah, you're nine, the instructor. Three zero three four, so I'm going to start over here on the left side of the panel. On the far left over here, that's the outside air temperature in uh, degrees Celsius, and then right below it, you got the electric clock. And then right below that, you got the ignition switch, you've got the off position, the dual ignition, which is right, left, then both, and then the start position. And then uh, moving up from there, so the panel is pretty simple. You got your six pack right here, airspeed indicator and knots, your attitude indicator and your altimeter, vertical speed, HSI, and your electric turn coordinator. And this, uh, the attitude indicator here runs on vacuum. That's the only vacuum driven instrument in the airplane. Up at the top here from left to right, you've got Fuel left and right in gallons. Yeah, three one six Tango Alpha. The cylinder uh, head temperature and oil pressure, pads. oil temp, and amps. There's a bit of a glare on the glass there, but that's kind of that's just what's up there on the top. Then you got your nav too. So as far as the avionics go, you've got the GTN 750, which is Garmin, and then you've got the King KX 165 right here. So the Garmin GTN uh, uh, 750. The CDI is linked to the HSI, and then the KX-165 is linked to this second CDI. So when you're shooting an ILS, you can have both of them up, and this is your primary, this is your secondary. Right below that, there's a fuel scan 450. I used to have one of these in 80991. As I speak right now, it's getting removed, I'm putting an engine monitor in. All right here, these are pretty cool. You don't see these all too Fiber much anymore. You don't see these too much anymore, but this is called a strike finder. It's got hundreds of little and LEDs inside here. It. And uh, it basically, it sweeps through these quadrants and it's looking for lightning strikes. And when it gets a Bell lightning strike, it shows Bell you where they found the lightning strike relative to the airplane there in the middle. And you've got different ranges, 25, 50, and 200. Or, sorry, 25, 50, 100, 200. And you can clear it, check flight time and all that stuff. So that's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Right here is the suction gauge, so that's telling you the instrument air, what kind of pressure we're getting from the vacuum pump. One, one, you uniform or this is the controller for the, the HSI right here. So one, right one, now, one, contact Atlanta Center two it's a slave zero in. Point two five that, means, that means at the moment, the HSI is slave to the magnetometer in the back of the airplane. If you undo that button, you can swing the HSI left and right to adjust it if it's off. So above the HSI controller, we've got the gear handle right here. That's just to put the landing gear up and down. And November then, one one, November one one seven three Golf contact Houston Center on one two zero point nine or seven. Have a good day. One two zero point nine or seven uh, seven three Golf. And I guess I should have said. So one nine four two Alpha Houston Center, Roger. Good afternoon, Houston Center, November uh, 1173 Golf, level 8000. November 1173 Golf, Houston Center, Roger, Natchez, Altimer 3033. 3033, 73 Golf. Envoy 3488, contact Fort Worth Center 132.27. So the red button on the gear handle here is actually linked to the airspeed indicator. Basically, is if you're below 70 knots on the airspeed indicator, the gear, you'll pull the gear up and it'll give you a uh, like a ringing, like an alarm saying, hey, you're too slow to pull the gear up. Um, and if that fails and it won't let the gear come up even though you're above 70 knots or let's say you're doing like a short field takeoff and you need the gear to come up quickly, you can pull the gear up and then hold down the red button and the gear will, will retract and come up. And that it's a, that's the override. I'll talk about the switches down here too. So on the far left side of the panel right by the ignition switch, you got the master switch. That's, that basically uh, connects the battery power, the battery to the rest of the airplane. It sends battery power to the bus. And to the right of that, you got Radio Master or Avionics Master, uh, that it's usually called. That just turns on the uh, the radio stack right here. 
and then you got low boost and high boost. Now, low boost and high boost is kind of like a, that's a continental thing. And that's because, so, low boost is like a regular boost pump, and then high boost is like, it's a more powerful boost pump. It just sends a higher fuel rate of fuel flow through. The high boost is only for emergencies. And the low boost is for like, if your engine starts running rough, or, you know, something goes wrong with your mixture or whatever, you turn on the low boost. Under no normal procedures do you use either of these boost pumps in this airplane according to the POH. And the thing with Continentals is the fuel flow is not, it doesn't have a regulator on it. I forget the exact term for the part, but it doesn't have a regulator on it basically. So while you're in flight, like in the Lycoming Mooney that I used to fly a lot, you turn on the boost pump for takeoff and landing and for any maneuvers that the engine's critical and stuff. Um, and it, it adds a little bit of fuel pressure to it to the engine, and if your engine-driven fuel pump fails, the boost pump keeps the engine running. So it's like a, a backup that you would turn on. But in this airplane, if you turn on the low boost, it actually increases the fuel pressure, and it doesn't have a regulator, so you're actually going to make it really rich. Now, this has been, uh, some and it's possible that you can choke out uh, the engine. So, uh, so we don't do that on a Continental. Light, uh, Just to the right of the, of the boost switches is the so alternate coming. static air. So if uh, the static ports outside get clogged up or one of them gets clogged up, you can pull that and it it uh, reverts the static and pitot instrument, or just the static instruments, um, so those three there, to uh, to the backup alternate static port. And then here you got the standby vacuum pump. This airplane has, it, has an electric vacuum idea. pump standby. And strobe lights, nav lights, landing light, and then pitot heat and prop the ice. This airplane has electric prop the ice. One here. I didn't observe. And you going to full stop at Barksdale right now? This is the uh, that's the elevator trim. So you can just so this there's electric trim in this airplane on the yoke, and it's right here on the yoke. Um, and I'll go over the the console here on the yoke here in a minute. But that slider switch is for electric trim. Now, right? If the trim starts rolling by itself, you can come up here, and it's conveniently placed right over the throttle. You can okay, kill the electric the, uh, trim. Good. And then right here is the electric primer for priming the engine. Your main engine controls here, you got the throttle, prop control, and then your fuel mixture, fuel to air mixture. Delta uh, 1673 the contact, uh, Houston Center 128.17. Down below here, you've got alternate air, and then parking brake, and then right here are the cow flaps. Cow flaps are like a back door to the uh, engine cowling. That basically allows the cylinders to cool off better during climbs and whatnot. Got your elevator trim indicator and your flap position indicator and the flap position switch. Down a little further, you've got cabin vent, defroster, and cabin heat. And then that's just a kind of placarded checklist there. Moving on down to the floor, you got your fuel selector. Off, left, and right, we've got two fuel tanks on this aircraft. Right behind that is a little window. It's kind of hard to see with the glare here, but it shows the position of the gear, and that's kind of like a secondary backup uh, position indicator for the for the landing gear. Trim wheel right there, and then got a fire extinguisher on the seat back here. And then going just back from the trim wheel, this is a manual gear extension. So when we get to Texas, I mean, we want to complete this mission first and get to Texas. So once we get to Texas, you're, I'm going to have you do a manual gear extension. They're really easy in this airplane. You pop this little tab up and this door opens and that's a rip cord. You grab it with your fingers and you just start pulling it up. And uh, it's like trying to start a lawnmower like 25 times. <laughs> and you just keep, keep pulling it, it spins <laughs> the flywheel and the gear starts coming down. It's an electric gear system on this aircraft. That's pretty much everything on the center console. We'll start talking about the avionics. Right here is the enunciator panel. You've got the, a dimmer button to make it dim and then you can push to test and all the lights come on. Except Cabin for the 32, starter power on. Fort Worth Center, 126.32. 2632, uh, Starter power on is not supposed to come on according to the POH, so that's all good. And you've got several lights here. So this light right here illuminates when the gear is down and locked. This is the, this is the gear in transit two, light. Zero. And then left fuel low, right fuel low, high or low vacuum pressure, two, high or low volts, and alternate air. But actually, if we come down here, and we pull the alternate air, you get the alternate air enunciation. Tablet 356. Has to do with the engine, not the static. Yeah. Um, you don't want to have alternate air open on the ground. It's, right. like, it's, it's kinda unfiltered. Like, kind of like car peat. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unfiltered air, so you don't want that open uh, on the ground or in precip or anything like that. 
That's our annunciator panel right here is the, the uh, magnetic deviation card for the compass. Houston, this is the Garmin GTN 750, and it is... That's a 1317 Houston Center. Get you out basically, well. it's basically like a flight management system, except not quite a flight management system, like a full flight management system, or FMS. Um, but it does have remote pretty much everything. So you got your comm frequencies here, active and standby. Your nav frequencies here, active and standby. So this is a nav comm. You got your full audio panel right here. You can select what you're listening to, split mode, speaker, marker beacon, blah, 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 blah. And then you got your intercom controls, so you can actually uh, isolate yourself from the passengers and the co-pilot, select functions for music and whatnot. So that's a lot of the audio controls. And then right here, we, you select which radio you're listening to. So there's monitoring one and two. Uh, you can select what you're transmitting on, transmit one or two. And then you got the ident button for the transponder, and you can put in a squawk code right here. You can squawk VFR. Um, and then you got your nav radios. Changing a frequency on this radio is really easy. You tap it. All the uh, you got all the numbers there, and set. you can also turn it with turn it with the knob right here. Um, and then all the basic GPS functions, uh, you know, track, desired track, distance, and all that good stuff. Um, and then you can hit home. And you've got all this stuff. You've got a traffic screen. American 1211 contact Houston Center 126.35. This airplane is 1090 uh, in and out ADSB, so it is ADSB equipped. You got the terrain page, weather charts, flight plan Alpha procedures. This is where you select departures, arrivals, approaches, and you can activate vectors to final all that good stuff. Tons of settings, airport info. I mean, this thing's loaded. So much stuff. The default that we use is the map. And uh, just uh, we just kind of cruise along with that set in there. As you can see, in a Moody M20K, 136 knots over the ground sucks. We've got a we've got a headwind right That's now. That's gnarly headwind, yeah. But in a Cessna, we'd be doing like 85, 85 knots over the ground. I'll take it. All right, below the GTN 750. It's a pretty standard NAVCOM. This is a King KX-165, not a 155. Many people are familiar with the 155. The difference between the 155 and the 165 is you've got this knob right here that says pull rad or pull radial. Um, so we can, what's in your, what's a VOR near us? This one right here? Where is it? Okay. What's a freak? Uh, 110.0. Okay, so we'll put 110.0 in here and that's going to give us a VOR over here. So what we do is we pull this guy out and it tells us exactly what radio we're currently on. We're on the 328 radial. Does that look about right? That uh, looks about right. That looks about right. So that's that's the difference between the 155 and the 165. It's got this radial function there. I don't believe there's any other differences, but I could be wrong. Below that, we've got our uh, we've got the King KAP 150 autopilot. This is a pretty Compared to what you're used to, this is a basic autopilot. Very. You're a little sad that you don't have your GFC 500 anymore, but... It does the job en route. I just... The climbs of the descent are a bit more of a pain in the ass. Yeah, they are. They are. Uh, but, ba I mean, it's got all the all the good stuff. We tested it flying the ILS into Asheville, and it did pretty well. I mean, it kept it right on the needles. Kept it right on the needles. And it... Uh, so it's got altitude heading mode, nav mode, and this is all coupled to the HSI. So you can set your heading bug, set your course on the HSI, and it'll follow it and it's going off what's on the 750. Um, and then you, you can do approach mode and back course, and then this is to test it, and then the autopilot master. And then if you need to quickly, this is also to climb, so if you hold this down or up button, that will descend you or climb you at 500 feet a minute, but the, draw, you hold it. the drawback is you have to sit here and hold it while it does that. If you need to disengage the autopilot, you can push AP engage, and that'll take it off, or you can come right over here and push the big fat red button right there on top of the yoke. And it's right by your thumb. That's a quick way to disengage the autopilot. Um, so you can see right now we've got altitude hold right at 8,000. It's holding us right at 8. And then we're tracking nav from what's on the GTN 750 and the HSI. And the AP master is engaged. Pretty straightforward autopilot. And it does capture the glide slope and it'll fly a glide slope down. Pretty nifty. Come up here, and we'll finish off the avionics actually. This is the Garmin GTX 345 transponder. This is what my dad and I have in our 172-80991. And you have the GTX 335 in your 172. So the 335 is ADS-B out, out only. only. This is ADS-B in and out. 
So we can actually connect our iPads, and in my case, I have my iPhone with Four Flight connected to uh, to the 345, and it's actually giving us traffic, and weather, and all that good stuff on yeah. our mobile devices. It, it it does do it through the Flight Stream 210. Oh yeah, that's another thing this airplane has. So there's a Flight Stream 210 in the panel, so you can actually get, you can get your route set on your iPad and send it to the panel, Airport and then Jeff, you'll get a message on the 750, and it'll say flight plan import, and you just click on the flight plan right here and, uh, and hit activate, and it's really, really nice, really, really nice. This little panel right up here is, this is pretty standard in Moonies, it's like where, usually the ELT is right here, and there's sometimes miscellaneous stuff. Right here, in this case, we have prop de-ice amps, DC amps up there. So go ahead, yeah, turn on the prop de-ice. And you see that little jump in the amps, you get a little, sorry, it's blurry on a GoPro. Um, so you get a little bit of electricity flowing to the prop, go ahead and turn it off. And then you see the drop there. So that's just telling you that the prop de-ice is working. So the traffic mute button here, that's basically linked to the 750. We got a traffic alert earlier, so we know the audible alerts are working. Um, but if you get a traffic alert or start screaming at you about traffic, you can just reach over here and smack the traffic mute, and it, uh, it'll it shut up and stop talking to you. So the, the fuel flow memory here, it just controls power to this old fuel flow unit, uh, but we're not using it because since then the it's been replaced by the JPI, um, so it's just off right now. We're not using it at all. Okay. ELT stands for Emergency Locator Transmitter, and uh, basically you've got either arm or on, and right now it's armed, and if we were to make a hard landing and you know, put a load on it or something, the ELT would go off. Or, if we know that we're going to go down, we lose our engine, we're going down, we're worried that we may make a, good, a landing that's so good that the ELT may not go off, but we still want to be found. So, we'll just come over here, it's a guarded or a gated switch, so you got to pull it, you got to pull it out and then up. You can't accidentally hit it, so you pull it out and switch it to on, and, uh, and that'll get the ELT going off. Uh, coming down here, right below the transponder, these are just interior lights for panel panel lights, glare shield, and panel. So if we got post lights and glare shield lights in this airplane, it's lit up pretty well. These two gauges are they were new to me before I saw this airplane. I, I knew it I knew what TIT stood for. I didn't know what C D T stood for. But uh, these these have to do with the turbo. One one seven three golf contact folks approach one three two point zero five. One three two zero five, uh, seven three golf. November one nine or four share off. Good afternoon approach. Um, Mooney November one one seven three golf level eight thousand. Mooney one one seven three golf folks approach out seven three zero three three. Three zero three three seven three golf. Almost at Skyhawk. Oh, I know, right? I do that all the time. So these two gauges have to do with the uh, the turbo. And it's kind of confusing how the needles are set up, but basically TIT is red right here from the needle coming from this side, and then CDT is red on this arc from the needle coming from this side. It's kind of weird, they crisscross, but once you figure out how to read it, it's, it's pretty easy. So CDT stands for Compressor Discharge Temperature, and that's basically telling us what the temperature of the air is coming out of the compressor side of the turbo and going into the intake manifold. So, ideally we want that air to be cooler. Cooler air is going to yield better performance on the engine. Uh, but we want to monitor that to make sure it doesn't get too hot. Right now it looks like we're about 175 degrees yeah. on the, this uh, compressor discharge temp. So that's not too bad. That's the temperature of the air that's entering our cylinders. And d double check me later, but I believe in the later model, starting in either 84 or 86, they, actually, they added the uh, an intercooler. Yes. To it. And an intercooler, so basically what an intercooler is, is it goes just downstream of the compressor outlet, or the compressor discharge of the turbocharger, uh, or of the turbo. And basically an intercooler is like a heat sink for the air coming out of the turbo. And it, it takes ram air, forces it through the fins on the, on the intercooler, and it cools off the air coming from the turbo going to the engine. It dramatically drops the intake the manifold. Intake, yeah. Intake manifold. Drops yeah. from... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. From the outlet, it drops what goes into right. the engine. So the air comes from the compressor discharger or discharge, and then goes into the intercooler, and it comes out the intercooler way cooler than this, and that yields better engine performance when the intake air is much cooler. 
TIT is turbine inlet temperature. So it's basically the uh, kind of the other side of compressor discharge temp, but it's on the, the other side of the turbo. So the air, this air is not going to be coming into the engine. It's exhaust. This is just turning the turbine. So the turbine and the compressor are two different parts of the turbo, and they're not to be confused. Am I right? Yeah. Call me I out. I mean, they're, no, they're, they're, they're connected by a shaft, right. but they're separate chambers. They are separate chambers. That yes. air does not mix, right. basically. Nowhere on the panel does it have an exhaust... It does not have three. an exhaust gas temperature, an EGT anywhere. TIT is basically our EGT because this is the temperature of the air coming into the turbine, turbine inlet temperature. The air is coming out of the exhaust manifold, coming into the turbine and spinning the turbine, which through a shaft spins the compressor, compresses the air and pushes air outside of the discharge of the compressor at this temperature. But that air, this air is not the same and it does not get mixed if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I might have just confused a lot of people, but I'm not sure. You can add a, just a, a visual of what a turbo looks like with the two That's chambers. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the two chambers, yeah. turbine and compressor. If you add a visual, it makes total sense. I'm going to add a visual. That's a good idea. Shout out to boldmethod.com. I'm going to steal your nifty diagram on how a turbocharger works. As the engine runs, the exhaust gas is diverted through the turbine and spins it very fast before that hot gas exits through the exhaust pipe. That turbine, through a mechanical shaft, then spins the compressor. The compressor takes in ambient air, compresses it to a much higher pressure, then discharges it into the intake manifold, where it will then enter the cylinders at a much higher pressure than it would with just ambient air. That's why a turbo-equipped aircraft can perform much better at high altitude than a naturally aspirated airplane can. It's like putting a positive pressure oxygen mask over the nose and mouth of your airplane, giving it sufficient air pressure and oxygen to perform at its peak performance despite the low ambient air pressure at altitude. So that's, that's basically these two gauges, and I felt those were important, pretty important to explain. And then just like any other complex airplane, you got uh, your revolutions per minute of the propeller, which is also the revolutions per minute of the, of the crankshaft. Fuel. Uh, you gonna switch fuel? Uh, yeah. How many we got? Over Look. here, I'm looking at this tiny gauge out here on the wing. I'm looking at about 22 gallons. Yep. Time to switch. Okay. All he's doing is just switching the tank, and we're gonna start burning off the other tank, and we're making sure our fuel flow is sustained, and the engine isn't giving us any hiccups. And of course, if the engine were to start sputtering, the next, very next thing you would do is undo what undo you just did. Undo what you just did. That's right. So, uh, anyways, over here we got the the prop RPM. And that's telling us exactly how much the uh, how how fast the prop is spinning, and that's controlled by the blue knob right here, the prop control. The prop control is actually controlling the prop governor, and then by that by it doing that, it changes the pitch of the prop for us. So indirectly, that knob controls this gauge indirectly. And then this guy is manifold pressure, and you can see that it actually goes up pretty high because this airplane is a turbo, or it, ha it does have a turbo on it. So on takeoff, Arnaldo increases the power up to about 36 inches, and then just from the ram air pressure with the increase in airspeed, we come up to about 40 inches of manifold pressure. And then that's our takeoff setting. And then right now we're at 65% power at this altitude, which is about 28 inches, leaned to about 1450 turbine inlet temperature. And then over here, you've got all the circuit breakers. So if any circuits have a fault, you'll see one of these pop out, and that's how we detect problems. And that is pretty much, for the most part, oh yeah, cigarette lighter, charging iPads and stuff. Did, did I forget anything? The yolks. Oh, the yolks. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, let me just, okay, these two buttons are also on the left side, so we're just going to go over the left side here. You want to talk about what's over here? Oh, you go ahead. Okay. So, on the left side here, you've got the trim which is right there on the front. Uh, you can probably go ahead and put your hand on the yoke yeah, and just show me what, show them what I'm talking about. Trim, yeah, trim, up and down. trim, nose up and down, and then the big red button is the AP disconnect, autopilot disconnect. And the little red button bullet beneath it is called CWS control wheel steering. So you can push and hold that button and hand fly the airplane, and then when you let go of that button, the autopilot is still engaged, and it continues flying the airplane. Um, and then on the other side of that side of the yoke, you've got your uh, it's labeled on the top. You got your mic button. That's the push to talk to talk to air traffic control. And then you got your map light, which turns on a little light bulb underneath the yoke, so you can see the whatever's sitting in your lap. Right here, you got your speed brakes. So this airplane is equipped with speed brakes, and uh, you you do have to hold that button down, and that helps us descend 
at a better rate without increasing the airspeed, the air, airspeed dramatically in this airplane because it is slick. It's a fast airplane. So that's your speed brake. And on this side, you got PTC ICS, which is basically like a voice recognition feature. Uh, hold down that button and speak a, a command recognized by Garmin, and the GTN 750 will execute that command. I don't know any of the commands. I don't, I don't know that they've been set up in this one, actually. They may honest. not, yeah. But I, I, I would just rather reach up and, and do this stuff on the Yeah, because I think it was in the system. Yeah, voice commands. Okay, yeah. The, I mean, they're turned on, I just don't know what they are. Right. If they haven't been used. Right. So, that's what that button does. This airplane does have an oxygen system. It is in-op. Uh, yeah, it's in-op. The bottle has been taken out. The, yeah, the, the bottle is not present in the airplane, but that's how you turn on and off your oxygen system. And you got your pressure here. Yeah, pressure, pressure gauge over here, and then that's the little port where you plug in your mask or, or cannula. And then you got the ports in the back uh, on the sidewall over there as well. Oh, and one of my <laughs> one of my favorite features of this airplane that didn't work in other movies, this little light above my head, and there's another switch back there in the back, but you got these little fins right here sticking up. There's another one on the other side. It's indirect cabin lighting, and ooh, it is so cool at night. It's also got it back there in the back seat, and then these are the speakers for the overhead radio. And of course, we got our we got our air vents and our visors and the magnetic compass up here. No, the GoPro does not affect the magnetic compass. It's shielded. I get that question a million times. That's pretty much it. That was a pretty thorough tour of the cockpit. All right, GoPro, you're going back where you belong. Like I said at the beginning, this was a very informal cockpit tour. I was just sitting there in the right seat and literally picked up the camera and started pointing at stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video and perhaps you got something out of it. If you liked the video, definitely hit like and subscribe if you haven't yet. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can head over to aviation101.com store to grab some Aviation 101 merch like the hat Arnaldo is wearing in this video. Also, go check out Lightspeed Aviation. Their links are all down in the description. They are the manufacturer of many fine aviation products, including the a &R headsets Arnaldo and I are wearing in this video. Video. Until next time, I want you to stay happy, stay healthy, stay current, and of course, stay proficient, and we will see you in the next video.